Hi there, on the bench today a thermal imaging camera kindly sent in to the channel by Eric Hill. I do not get paid for the video, but I do get to keep the camera, so I mark it as a promotion. But as you know, that doesn't stop me from giving you an unbiased review. With that out of the way, here is the quick list of specs. Imagine you are new into IR cameras, studying the specs of a camera, so maybe a quick assessment of what this here says may be useful for you. The thermal resolution is 240 by 240 pixels, which is pretty good for a thermal imaging camera. Not long ago such resolutions were only available on high-end cameras. On the other hand, the noise equivalent temperature difference, or NETD, of lower or equal 60 millikelvin is no more than middle of the road, meaning the sensitivity for small temperature differences could be better. The field of view is pretty wide angle, which means this camera is excellent for surveying rooms or larger electric or HVAC installations, and just based on that it will struggle visually separating tiny components on a PCB. But if you read on, the focal length is just 1.35 mm, so you should be able to get incredibly close to the PCB and still get a decent image, which makes up for the wide field of view. The drawback with that approach is that it's sometimes difficult to get a bulky camera close enough to a PCB installed inside its enclosure. The length for temperature measurement is 0.3 meters to 3 meters, or about 1 foot to 10 feet. This means, while you can view images that are closer or further away, the temperature readout is most accurate when the source is at the distance in that range, and that range has been set in the camera. The camera needs to know how far an object is, because the heat radiation reaching it drops with the inverse square of the distance. If the object is really twice as far as the camera thinks it is, only one quarter of the normal heat radiation gets to the camera. Thus the camera will show such an object much cooler than it really is. The reverse is true for objects much closer to the camera. So this means if we use the camera for PCB work, we need to be aware that, that while it will show hot components, the temperature readings will generally be higher than they are in reality. Sorry for the lengthy intro, let's get on with it. The camera comes in a nice semi-rigid case with a zip. Inside is the camera, a USB charge lead and a manual. The camera is completely encased in rubber and seems to have a laser, which is more akin to standard infrared thermometers and not cameras, and it's not much larger than one of these thermometers. Let's see if it works. Obviously there's enough charge in the lithium battery, a nice splash screen which stays and stays. It's definitely not the fastest boot time, 10 seconds. For a first test, I use again the same ovenized crystal oscillator PCB as I used for other thermal cameras. This is demonstrating that due to the wide field of view, the PCB looks pretty small if you hold the camera about 30 cm or one foot away from it. The camera shows the temperature at the center, the highest and the lowest, and indicates where these points are. It also shows the distance setting of 0.6 meters and the emissivity setting of 0.95. Both of these are the default values after reset, so for a real temperature measurement these should be modified. But, as I mentioned, if there is room for the camera, it is possible to get much closer, enabling pretty good images of individual components on the PCB. It is not as good as a thermal camera with a macro lens, but usable. Removing the protective film on the display. Whoops. But not to worry, I managed to grab the film and here it goes. Operation is very easy. We have the power button and a long press turns the unit on. A short press on the power button brings up the menu and the up-down button moves between the options as you would expect. A short press on the power button selects the option, the return key brings you back. And a long press on the power button turns the unit off, all very easy and intuitive. This thermal imaging camera has no second camera for visible light, so the infrared image is all you get. Its lens is nicely recessed for protection, which is good. The second object installed on the front of this camera is actually a laser, and like on an infrared thermometer, the trigger button shoots a laser, but you can turn the laser off in the settings. Releasing the trigger not only turns the laser off, but also takes a snapshot of the thermal image and saves it in the camera's memory. 
So if you use the laser a lot, you will end up with a lot of saved images, whether you want them or not. The camera has a tripod mount on the bottom, which is nice to have. There's a squarish hole next to it, which looks like the USB port, but no. There's also one on the front, again looking exactly like a USB-C port. Together they are either meant to attach a lanyard, but none was supplied, or for a laptop style security lock cable. I don't have one, so I can't test if that would work. There is a mysterious rubber plug on the handle. Pulling it reveals two screws, obviously to open the unit. The USB port for charging and accessing the snapshots is actually located on the top, behind a generous rubber bung. When off and plugged in for charging, the camera shows briefly an animated charging screen and then turns the screen off. A nice touch, since you want all the power going to the battery rather than showing an animated screen. In any case, a small LED next to the USB port shows red while charging and turns green when the battery is full. Charging happens at 5V and 1A. Battery life is very good. I got hours of use with just the half charged battery the unit came with and it was by no means empty. A quick run over the settings. The first one, called Album, is where the camera stores the saved images. The album folder shows as photos on your PC when you plug the USB in. The camera creates folders based on year and month. The files are timestamped bitmap images of 240 by 240 pixels, but with the info overlaid, just what is shown on the screen. Pressing the power button brings the deletion menu and another press deletes the image and opens the next. Deleting is very streamlined, probably because, as I mentioned when talking about the laser, you can end up with a lot of unwanted images. Of course, you can also mass delete from the PC via the USB cable. Next is emissivity, and we will look at that in a moment. Then comes distance, which is important to set right for accurate measurements. The pseudo color selection is next. They are the usual selections that most cameras offer. It is really a matter of personal taste. The display settings allow you to select what is superposed on the display. Alarm needs to be enabled before you can see or change the settings. The rule can be greater than or less than. Level allows you to select the temperature range. Easiest is to leave it in auto, where the camera switches between ranges by itself. More settings allow changing the temperature unit, language, setting of date and time, enabling or disabling the laser, and setting auto power off. Let's see what the about device offers. Copyright info is not terribly exciting. Version is more useful as it shows the firmware version and possibly versions of the hardware. Storage is 3.64 GB, which is plenty for those small bitmap images. Next, we can format storage, do a factory reset, and a firmware update. Selecting this brings the message of no update file. Obviously, one needs to download the new firmware and copy it into the album folder. On the emissivity, I assumed one would just use the up-down keys to change the 0.95, shown as the factory default, similar to, for example, distance. But then I realized that this has a submenu. The custom emissivity is indeed just for changing the number with the up-down keys, but there are a whole bunch of presets, which is a nice touch, that I have not seen in other thermal cameras. Most only have a table in the manual, but here you have it in the camera as well. Of course, there are tables online with many more entries, but this is quite useful to have handy. To try out the alarm, I changed the setting to give a warning when temperature exceeds 50 degrees Celsius and an alert when going over 100 degrees Celsius. For testing, I used my hot plate, which was set to 50 degrees Celsius, which it almost reached. I then cranked it up to 250 degrees Celsius or 482 degrees Fahrenheit. I am using accelerated playback to speed things up. When the warning threshold is exceeded, the high reading changes from white to yellow, and when it's later crossing the 100 degrees Celsius, it turns red. This is it. Nothing else happens. No beep whatsoever. This device is completely silent. 
When crossing 150 degrees Celsius or 300 degrees Fahrenheit, the camera automatically switches to the high temperature measurement range. As for accuracy of measurements, it is a tricky subject to get the emissivity right, the table in the menu notwithstanding. Usually the thing you are measuring is not in the table and some tweaking may be needed by using a trusted reference. In this test, I left the emissivity at 0.95 but monitored the temperature of the hot plate with a thermocouple which is the blue circle at the bottom right. The thermocouple read quite a bit lower than the camera but as you can see from the color pattern on the hot plate and the differences between center and high readings, there are big temperature gradients on the plate while it's heating up. For measurements, it is much better to get the hot plate to temperature and then turn the power off. The residual temperature then equalizes fairly quickly across the whole plate and I found that the thermocouple was within 5 degrees Celsius of the high reading and close to the center reading. So I would say the camera's accuracy for high temperatures is okay. For body temperature, I set emissivity to human skin and tested it against myself on my forehead and compared with a the thermocouple, the difference was just 0.1 degrees Celsius, which is excellent. I am not so sure if I like the overall design in terms of human factors. If the camera is positioned like this, that is tilted forward, the sensor is looking in a horizontal line to the left. Clearly this is what you are supposed to do and the screen is angled in a way to allow you to read it comfortably in that position. The problem, which might be just me, is that I am used to use a camera screen as a viewfinder and clearly in this position I would expect to see something that is somewhere downward from the horizontal. Similar, when I am holding the camera so that the screen is vertical to me, I would expect to see something horizontally straight ahead, but instead I am seeing things much higher than horizontal. Couple this with the limited resolution of all thermal images and the lack of a superimposed outline from a normal camera and you constantly wonder what you are actually looking at. This is actually where the laser comes to the rescue and this works surprisingly well. Here I am using the camera against two smoke detectors. There is a 20 plus year old one which is mains powered with a backup battery and since it still works I have not gotten around removing it. Next to it is a more modern one with a built in 10 year battery. In trying to target the detectors, I find it really counterintuitive not to use the camera screen as a viewfinder. But when I do and point the screen to the smoke detectors, I actually just see the ceiling over my head. If I engage the laser and steer it to shine on the old smoke detector, I get it right in the middle of the screen. Perfect. The weak laser dot is of course not visible on the infrared, so you must look over the camera directly at the object. Once I got that trick, the camera was a breeze to use. All in all, the Eric Hill ETI-01 is a robust and easy to use thermal imaging camera. It's just about usable for PCB work, but don't buy it for that purpose only. This camera is better suited for doing room surveys where the novel use of the laser targeting can overcome the lack of a second camera. But I would wish that the laser and taking snapshots were two different buttons because you use the laser a lot, you end up with a lot of unwanted pictures. If you like my videos, don't forget to subscribe and maybe consider becoming a Patreon. That would really help the channel. The links in the description. As Patreon you always get early access to videos, a blog and other exclusive content. Thanks for watching.